You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and this week I'm talking with Dantley Davis, VP of Design and Research at Twitter. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. Hi, my name is Dantley Davis, and I'm the VP of Design and Research at Twitter. Well, first of all, congratulations on the new role. You've been at Twitter now for, what, about three months now? A little shy of three months. How's the experience been so far? It's been amazing. Um, I'm having the time of my life. That's a rarity for someone to say they're having the time of their life at work. <laughs> well, what's a what's a regular day like for you at Twitter? My day is comprised of uh, basically two halves. I spend half my time with Jack and his direct reports, and then I spend the other half with my leads and the team. When I'm with my uh, team, it involves uh, looking at our recruiting pipeline, reviewing work helping uh, my directs get unblocked as it pertains to just core development work. And I spent a lot of time um, reviewing portfolios and finding candidates of diverse backgrounds. Yeah, I spoke just recently with uh, with a actually a mutual colleague of, your, of ours, Forrest Young. Yep. We spoke last week, actually. He was telling me about kind of some of the diversity work that you're doing at Twitter. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, so... Um, uh, systemically at the company level, we're, we're decentralizing our um, offices. So what that means is that we have a pretty considerable amount of our employee workforce in San Francisco, and uh, we have a good presence in New York, and we actually want to move those offices to other locations around the world and hire people where they're at. I think one of the things that uh, is is um, an advantage of Twitter being a worldwide service is that if we can hire people in the communities where they're from, those diverse perspectives and points of view get brought into the product itself. So my personal point of view, and this is echoed by the the senior leadership at the team, is that one of the most effective ways that we can actually have a diverse workforce is allowing people to work and live in the communities that they're most passionate about. Nice. And now you've worked in design leadership positions at a lot of well-known companies, at Yahoo, at Facebook, uh, at Netflix, which we'll talk about in a little bit. What attracted you to Twitter? Um, you know, one of the things that resonated with me about Twitter was the public conversation and the culture that gets represented on the platform. So that that's you know a- everything from Black Twitter to the NBA and social movements, going from a hashtag to social movements. And the power of the internet, I think, is represented in the people who use the platform. And I wanted to be close to that. And it's actually one of the reasons why I went to Facebook from Netflix was to use my design background to have positive impact through technology and At Twitter, I feel that I'm able to do that more directly as it pertains to the communities that use the platform. Now, I have to ask this just because you you mentioned Black Twitter, and I'm going to assume the answer to this is yes, but does Twitter know about Black Twitter? Like Twitter HQ, do they know that Black Twitter is a... Is an entity, is a thing that's out there in the world. Oh, for sure. Uh, <laughs> Black Twitter is is very much known about at Twitter. Black Twitter is talked about at the most highest levels of Twitter. Really, uh, we love that community. <laughs> uh, I'm a member of that community, and it's a very important aspect of the product experience and the culture of the company. Wow. Speaking of the culture of the company, what's the design culture like there? The design culture is uh, very open, um, and the team is comprised of folks who are um, entrepreneurial. They're um, they're curious. Uh, the The team is uh, a strong partner with our engineering and product management um, colleagues. So it's a very vibrant design culture. What does specifically, I guess, the design and research team look like? Because I'm assuming that's what you're over as VP. When you say look like, what do you mean by that? 
What is it comprised of in terms of types of designers, types of researchers? So on the design side, we have um, both generalist product designers uh, that do both uh, interaction design and visual design. And, you know, they might have uh, strengths in one area over the other, but they can do both. And we have specialists. So we have illustrators, um, visual designers, motion designers, um, art directors, creative directors. And on the research side, we have um, quantitative researchers. So these are folks that deal with data at scale. We have qualitative researchers, and these folks spend a lot of their, their time out in field, either doing field research and validation of work that we're doing, and also ethnographic research where they're um, spending time in the you know lives of Twitter users and internet users to understand their motivations. And then we have a cohort of user testers that work to get signal on the product mechanics. And that feedback is then given back to the core product teams for iteration. It sounds like there's a lot of data then that goes into design decisions. If you have that that sort of breadth of qualitative, quantitative, ethnographic research and everything, a lot of that plays into the decisions that are made. So they're not just made randomly at a whim. It's coming from a place of truth in a way. For sure. There's a great deal of intuition that goes into the work. And then that intuition is measured by feedback that we get in market. Nothing is done in isolation. What's been the biggest challenge so far? I think, you know, one of the challenges for me personally is um, uh, ramping up uh, in the context of this new team and getting to know everyone. At the same time, working with my other team, which is Jax Directs, the heads of engineering, heads of uh, product management, our CMO, CFO, and ensuring that the conversations that happen in that context, I can transparently provide that feedback to my team and that they also get to know me. So I've been spending a lot of time with them, you know, dinners and outside of core working meetings just so they understand my perspective and point of view. Okay. And now because these design decisions are fueled by research and fueled by data, what have been sort of the best ways that you found to explain that data to stakeholders to inform those decisions? Um, that happens in a few ways. Uh, more traditionally, uh, we have research reports that the researchers distribute to the product teams. Those come in document form. There's a TLDR version of that um, research. So that the product teams have the ability to you know, get the highlights without having to go and do a deep dive. We also uh, have uh, uh, reviews of the research so that the researchers can fill questions from the various stakeholders across our product groups. That can lead to additional research for clarification, or it can lead to just a really good, healthy, vibrant discussion about an insight that might have been discovered. And then, you know, a, an approach that I've used in the past that we're working on at Twitter is to actually do documentary style recording of the research when we're in field to tell the story and the narrative of what's happening with people um, in their lives. And so we can show the the nuance of, of communication between individuals, the the both joy and pains that people are experiencing when they, they need to share a particular point of view to their community. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that will go a long way in bringing some heart to the research findings and having a more empathetic connection with the research and the product teams. Interesting. So these documentary style features, are those just kind of screened internally so people can get a better sense of how Twitter is used out there in the world? Yes, but I, I do want to make that more available to the public. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do have aspirations, as does Jack, to to make our work transparent and more public. And you know we're just early days in figuring out how best to do that, but that is the plan. Twitter TV. <laughs> that could. <laughs> That could be a thing. I mean, you know, people people live tweet television shows. You know, it's that could be an option. You never know. You can binge watch research <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> there's a probably there's probably a subset of people that would really like that though, for real. <laughs> so speaking of that data, I mean, of course, a lot of people that use the platform have a ton of we'll just call it feedback. They have a ton of feedback about what Twitter should be doing. 
how Twitter should look. I mean, even, you know, honestly, here at Glitch, uh, one of our other podcast function, we did a whole episode on Twitter having an edit button. Mm -hmm. What are like some of the things that you hear from people, just like regular users about ways that they want Twitter to change from a design sort of standpoint? You know, it's wide and varied. So I, I do hear quite often about the edit button. I am also a proponent of having the edit button. Um, I also hear that people want more control over their tweets. So they don't always want wide distribution of their tweets. And if someone retweets them, they want to understand which audience will see that information. And um, if they get at mentioned, they also want the ability to prevent that from happening so they can lock down their content. Mm. There's been suggestions from folks around interests and having more interest-based conversation being uh, prevalent on the service. I've heard a lot about customization. I couldn't talk about this topic without mentioning, um, and I get I get mentioned quite often on on Twitter about this, and that's dark mode for Android, which is coming. Mm. I promise you, it's coming. So there's a there's a lot. It's varied, and depending on you know where you sit on you know even on, from a topic and interest perspective, you might have some very narrow uh, feature requests specifically for that domain. As an example, there's a lot of stock traders on Twitter, and they want a ticker hmm. on Twitter, and you know, that's that's a very specific thing that they want. And, you know, we take that feedback and we try and identify how we can provide the most value relative to our, you know, team size on new features that we can ship for folks. Yeah. One thing that I know that I've heard of recently is, uh, well, of course, Twitter recently has had a new redesign of its main kind of web based interface. And it appears to be very narrow just in terms of the, you know, the the width of the actual view of the, of the service. And I mean, I'm on a widescreen monitor, so I can't really talk. I have like one of those 34 inch curved widescreen. So everything has extra space. But yeah. when, when it comes to design decisions, I would imagine you all are looking at a lot of data to be able to inform what types of choices are made when it comes to that web-based interface. Yeah. There's a, a whole host of uh, variations on density that the team has worked on. And, and one thing to call out is that the web work is work in progress. We're not done. Okay. Um, what we shipped is basically V1, and the team has a roadmap of iteration, including um, working through density and allowing the browser window and density to scale relative to the browser size. Mm. But as you know, working in product, um, you strike this balance between shipping early versus perfection. And if we worked through perfection, we'd probably never ship. So the team made decision on what they felt was the minimal valuable product. Mm -hmm. And that's what's out today. And they're going to continue to iterate and work on it. The core reason for the redesign was actually not the redesign itself. It was the tech stack. The Twitter web tech stack was um, archaic and just simple changes meant you know, months of development. So this new tech stack enables us to make changes rapidly in days or hours in many cases. And so you'll see a lot of updates based on user feedback. And the team is very much, um, ha you know, they do have their, their ears to the ground, so to speak, in terms of uh, how people are using it, um, the feedback they're receiving, and they're prioritizing that feedback. Um, and uh, the website will change and evolve based on the feedback. Okay. And also, I know a lot of folks, I mean, I've kind of even voiced this concern too, just about the timeline itself. I think it may have happened a couple of months ago where Twitter now gives you the option to switch between a sort of, I guess, chronological timeline and more of a like algorithm, like algorithmic based timeline. And I, I'm assuming the algorithm is to kind of improve the user experience. And that algorithm is based off of research and data, like you mentioned before with other features. What sort of balances that that interest between, I guess, what people want to see in their timeline and then interest from advertisers and revenue goals and things like that? Well, um, the the core thing is we want to create a great experience. And with the chronological timeline, um, and I'll speak about 
you know, these feeds in general, um, independent of just Twitter, because there's a lot of uh, similarities, whether it's Netflix or Facebook or even Instagram, where if it's chronological, there's a lot of work that the um, user has to do if they haven't been in the timeline for a while. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of tax put on people to try and catch up. And uh, while some of us have a lot of time to spend catching up, a lot of us don't. You look at the number of sessions that mobile users have per day and the number of seconds they spend per session, you just can't get through all the content. So most apps have made a decision to have a algorithm-based timeline. Uh, And Twitter made that same um, decision. And uh, the other benefit of using an algorithm is that you can surface relevant content based off of how you view and interact with the content that's in your timeline. So the goal is to actually make the timeline more helpful to you. So if you spend a lot of time on black Twitter or you spend a lot of time with sports, that those are signals that the algorithms can use to get you more content similar to those particular interests without you spending a lot of time hunting for it. Now, uh, what Twitter had done is to give people choice. So you can use the timeline based on those recommendations driven by the algorithm, or you can switch to a chronological view of your timeline. That user control has actually been viewed fairly positively because you know there is control in the hands of the user. Uh, most apps don't or have chosen not to provide that that control. And those are decisions independent of ads. You know, ultimately we just want to create a great experience for people. And if they find value in the service, they're finding the content they want, they're connecting with the accounts that are meaningful to them, then the ad side will take care of itself. That's interesting that you mentioned that the algorithm is kind of about people that are like sort of trying to catch up for the day. Because now that I think about it, a lot of the people I know that don't like that change are people that are always on the service. Yeah. And other, other, you know, places do this too. Instagram, Well, Instagram probably does it to a much different degree because my timeline tends to be all out of order. But like even LinkedIn does it. You'll go and they have top or they have recent. And I normally want to see recent, but that's because I'm always on LinkedIn. I don't necessarily want to see the top stuff because I may have already seen it. So that makes a lot of sense then. One more kind of Twitter question and then we can sort of (laughs) move on past that. Uh, In the spirit of making sure that you're creating a great experience for people on Twitter. So in the vein of making sure that you're creating a great experience for users, how do you take sort of negative interactions that happen on Twitter and use that to sort of fuel things? I'm I'm thinking most recently this example of, of Jack actually trying to have like a public conversation via Twitter with a journalist ended up sort of devolving into into chaos. How do you use encounters like that to improve the experience of using Twitter? It's a good question, and and uh, one of the reasons why I felt compelled to to join the company. I want the platform to be healthy. I I want to see the best of human behavior and not you know the worst of it. It points to how in a very focused conversation amongst two people, the internet can basically drag that conversation in a completely different direction, and then no one really benefits from it. So. To up level the the topic, the company's number one objective is health, health of the platform, health of the ecosystem, to enable people to have healthy and constructive public conversations on the platform. And then there's a number of initiatives that we're working on to enable that to happen. Some of it is around our terms of service and our policies, which um, the design and research team is working more closely with um, our our legal team than ever. And in other cases, it's actually making product changes that can have positive impact uh, within Twitter itself. Some of that goes back to some of the earlier things I mentioned around giving users control over who sees the content. We've recently tested the ability for people to hide replies. We do feel like that it's important in the context of the public conversation that you know the record is shown. Um, so those replies are hidden, and if if someone wants to see them, they can, but they're hidden. You know, we'll likely explore other moderation experiences. And just to you know tie this back to the olden days of the internet during internet forums, you had community moderators that 
offer the check and balance in these conversations. Um, and you know, Twitter doesn't have a community moderator, but I can see a world in which something like that is of interest. Uh, I can't say specifically that's what we're working on, but that model has worked. And I think there's other services like Reddit that have also introduced moderation. So I think it's going to be a combination of people, policy, and product changes Mm -hmm. over time that's going to get us to a place where two people can have a conversation and not get dragged. Yeah. I was just thinking of some older Twitter-like services that offered some of that level of, I don't know, kind of like granular moderation. Uh, Do you remember Pounce? I might be showing my age here by saying these things, but I do. Remember I do remember Pounce. Pounce. Yeah, I'm, I'm an old school internet <laughs> OG. <laughs> Pounce. Um, I think Plurk. Plurk is still around, actually. That surprised me. I found that out the other day. Uh, but they have sort of the similar thing where you can make a post and then really control, like who sees what, yep. and even who can comment on it. Like it can only be followers. It can only be I don't know people that's subscribed to a certain hashtag or yeah. something like that. Whereas now, kind of the option is it's either you're public or you're private and you yeah. can kind of you kind of just have to do a lot of the moderation on your own there's no built-in feature or tool that helps you do that yeah so before twitter you were the design director at netflix that's actually how we first became uh, acquainted with each other and the work that you've done in netflix has really helped make netflix a a household name and you were there for a long time what was it like there yeah, I was there for seven years. It was an amazing experience. When I started at Netflix, I was a lead designer, and Netflix was a DVD company. And I love the culture of Netflix, the the way that they describe it is around freedom and responsibility. Um, so no one was there to tell you no, um, but if you messed up too many times, you're fired. Um, <laughs> I think that's and, anywhere, though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, you know, it was a very creative place. It was one in which experimentation uh, was encouraged. Reed Hastings described it as an annual um, experiment, which uh, it very much felt that way. My job changed every year. I, I started working on the website and, you know, I worked on the TV interface and the mobile interface and the kids' experience and second screen and, you know, seeded some of the early uh, ideas around interactive TV. And it was just an evolution as um, streaming was evolving. It was just a, a very magical time. Now, I want to go more into your career in design. But uh, before that, I really want to learn more about just sort of like where you came from and how you've gotten to this place. Uh, where are you from? And and was design kind of a big part of your childhood growing up? Um, so I'm a military brat. And with military brats, whenever someone asks a question, it takes a while to explain it. So <laughs> I, I was born in, in Kunsan, um, Korea, and uh, I'm half black, half Korean. My dad was in the military for 24 years, and we traveled a lot. Um, every year and a half, we moved to a different base. And I, I wouldn't say design was a big part of my life, but building things were. Mm. Uh, when I was um, a kid, I would take apart all my dad's radio equipment that he bought when he went overseas to Japan and brought back. <laughs> so literally, I would get a screwdriver and disassemble all his radio equipment. And um, he felt that he should channel this energy that I had. And he bought me a secondhand computer when I was eight. And I learned to program Visual Basic. Mm. Um, And uh, from there, I was modifying computer games and uh, doing a whole host of things in in gaming as it it pertained to both uh, code and um, uh, modeling. So I was doing 3D modeling, and that led to uh, me creating new textures and the like. And I built radio control cars and RC airplanes and model kits and you know I, those model kits I painted and and weathered and so the just the, this notion of making things was always that was always part of my life and it wasn't until I got to high school that a teacher told me that I could have a career in graphic design and it was something I'd never even heard of and um, I had no um, real concept that this hobby that I had of mine that I actually tried not to talk about because it was not cool to to be a computer nerd back in the you know early 90s in Southern California. Mm-hmm. That was when I realized that this could actually be a career for me, and and that's really how it started. 
And then you went to the University of San Francisco. You got your your undergrad degree there as well as your master's degree. What was your time like there? Um, my time at, at USF was was great. I think the most informative time for me was getting my MBA. Uh, that was crucial for me because then I was able to connect the, the vocabulary of what was important to executives and business leaders to the design work that I was doing. So it was no longer just about design from a feeling perspective or craft perspective, but it was also designed from a ROI point of view as it pertains to benefits to the business. And that vocabulary allowed me to translate the design work into ways in which I could bring value back to the business and value to customers. Now, let's talk about your your early career. I mean, you were there in Silicon Valley in like those, I think it was like the, what, post-bubble days? Like, yeah. I'm guessing this is around like 2002, 2003, something like that. I was there in 96. Oh, oh, ooh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like working in Silicon Valley in those days? Because I mean, that was really, 96 was around the time when I guess the browser wars were really kind of in full effect. Yeah, it was a it was an interesting time. I mean, just right before coming to San Francisco, I was in LA, and I was working on um, websites for DJs at a hip hop station in LA, and that's how I got discovered. I, I, there was an agency in San Francisco that seen my work and and asked me to come up and and spend some time with them. And going from LA, where it was you know it's car culture, it was a um, obviously very influenced by the, the movie and film industry. And as I mentioned earlier, I had to hide my um, passion and, and love for technology. And coming to San Francisco in 96, I felt like I found my tribe. Okay, It was cool to be a nerd. And I could just literally let my hair down. I had long hair at the time. <laughs> and be me. And it was, it was a very freeing moment for me. And... During that time, uh, I mean, I was 18 years old and I knew how to code. I knew how to use desktop publishing tools and I had these skills that were rare. So it enabled me to get access to projects and to uh, work that I probably had no business working on. And it was at the time you know, experience that was about learning and experimenting. There was no right answer because no one had, you know, really done it before. And uh, I spent a lot of my time just trying to craft my, my or hone my craft mm-hmm. um, and uh, become an, an expert at both uh, being a designer and a developer. And now Silicon Valley and, and really the whole like San Francisco Bay Area has just exploded because of technology. I mean, we're talking 96 with the browser wars and then you got the dot com bubble. And then, of course, now the sort of massive growth that's coming out of of Silicon Valley. I just want to know, like being there for over 20 years now, like what is it like navigating that world? I mean, certainly we hear a lot of, I think, really negative stuff about tech from Silicon Valley, you know, tech bro culture and things of that nature. How do you navigate that world and stay authentically you in that environment? You know, when I came to the Valley, I was the only brown person I saw. Mm -hmm. Unless I went to Oakland or to Hunters Point in San Francisco, I got my hair cut. Black people just did not exist in Silicon Valley. And I, I remember walking into an elevator of a company I was at and the janitor who was black came up to me and shook my hand. And he said, I was the first black person he ever seen go in that elevator. Wow. And it hit home for me because I, I wasn't a tech bro. I was a brother in tech, but I was not a tech bro. <laughs> and, you know, I worked well with the teams during the day, but then when they went out to the bar and socialized in the evening, I felt like an outsider. Mm. So, you know, I, I spent my free time just in the lab making sure that there were, there were no kinks in my ability to do great work. So they could never use that as an excuse. My, my dad told me, and I'm sure a lot of uh, people of color have heard this, that you have to work two times harder than the people around you. Yep. And so when they were at the bar, I was working on being a better programmer and being a better designer. 
Um, I was, you know, fortunate that I was single and I had all this free time to do that. The, the main difference in that particular area, which is diversity between then and now, is that there's a lot more brown people in the valley now than there was then. Um, there's a lot of folks who've come all over the world and have a lot of different experiences, both as you know, black Americans and, and folks from Africa and, and Caribbean uh, countries um, who are in the valley now trying to find their way. And that's great to see. The number is still relatively small compared to the percentage of brown and Latinx people there are in the United States, but I don't feel like I'm the only one. I literally am not obviously the only one anymore. Right. But I guess in terms of like, I guess I'm just curious because you've worked at these really big companies where certainly conversations around diversity and tech have always popped up. They've been at Facebook. They've been at Twitter. I would imagine they've also been at other companies that you've been at. How have you seen sort of the conversation change over the years? Early in my career, the conversation never came up. Hmm. In fact, if it did come up, it was because someone made a racist comment. And then that's what we were talking about was the racist comment. But literally, it didn't come up uh, unless it was negative. And uh, early in my career, I was, you know, I was afraid to to bring it up because uh, I was the only one and I had no support. And when I saw another black person, I like ran to them. They became my best friend because I, in a lot of cases, just needed someone to talk to and how to, you know, navigate the situation. And there were times where early in my career, I would walk into a meeting with a senior person and I would get sized up. I mean, I, I grew up in L.A. for uh, L.A. area for my um, high school years. So I understand what it means to be sized up. And I was being sized up. Mm. The way I took it was you don't belong here. And I'm asking you these questions to make you feel uncomfortable. So I I just kept my nose down and ran this kind of contradictory. I kept my nose down as it pertained to diversity because I didn't have any support, but I ran to the hardest problems at the company. Hmm. Regardless of what company I worked at, I made sure I worked on the highest visible, hardest problem there and made sure I crushed it. And that gave me more responsibility. I was always then asked to work on the hardest problems. And I felt that by just being there, by doing the work, by providing value, that I was showing the people who were sizing me up that uh, I deserved to be there. And for the, probably the first half of my career, that's how I approach the situation. The latter part of my career, and, and this is mostly associated with, with my dad, uh, he had passed in, in 2010. And um, just to give you some context on him, he, he raised my sisters and I as a single parent. Mm. He, um, he joined the Air Force so he wouldn't get drafted to the Marines during the Vietnam War. He did two tours in Vietnam. So he was raised in Brooklyn. He has these three kids um, that he's raising. And he, he had us read um, at 10 uh, Malcolm X, Black Robes, White Justice, Manufacturing Consent by Noam Chomsky. This is part of summer reading for us. <laughs> and uh, he he saw that in me that no matter how successful that I became in my career, I needed to bring other people with me. Mm -hmm. Like he, you know, when he was alive, those were the conversations that we were having was like, what, what are you doing to bring others with you? So when he passed, I felt obligated to speak on his behalf um, to make sure that the the culture that I was so connected to was represented in the work that I was doing. Um, and so every chance I got, I, I made sure from research research that we were doing, data that we were, we were gathering, and um, uh, product vision that we were defining, that the underrepresented groups that were so pervasive and using technology were at the table, that that point of view was spoken about, discussed, the research was done with them, about them, for them, and that I was able to connect that back to value to the business. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just we were, you know, that we were doing it for reasons that Danley thought we were doing it for. It was because it was actually good business to do it. Um, and I spent the last 10 plus years of my career in every corner of the work I do focused on that. And it's, uh, it's worked. So it sounds like you've connected 
uh, this this greater purpose to the work. For sure. Yeah. Now, having worked at a number of these different companies and leadership positions, I'm curious, what do you think is probably like the single most important skill that a designer needs to possess these days? I mean, aside from general knowledge of design, of course, but what do you think is the skill that they need to possess? So I'll, I'll say that there's two. Okay. Uh, the first is business acumen. So understanding how to talk about your work relative to the business impact it's going to have. Um, otherwise, it's just an art program. So that's number one. The second is curiosity. Now, I look for designers who have a tremendous amount of curiosity about other people. And if you have that curiosity, you're, you're not looking under the same rocks for the same answers. You're trying to understand the motivations in other people's lives. Uh, these people... Uh, may have lived in a different country than you. They might be a different gender, skin color, socioeconomic differences. That curiosity is so important to having an amazing design career and creating great products. Are you where you want to be at this stage in your life? That's a great question. I think in, in many ways I am. I have a you know amazing family. I'm doing uh, the best work of my career. So from you know checking boxes. Uh, of the things that you aspire to when you're you know, early in your career, I'd say yes. But in terms of where I, I what I want to do outside of my career and the impact I want to have on uh, my community, I'd say no. I, I feel like I, there's still a lot that I can give to um, the people that, that look like me, the folks that, that don't have support and representation. Uh, there's a lot more to give there. Do you have a, an idea of what that would look like? Yeah, I think at some point it might be starting a, a company specifically focused on this endeavor. In other cases, it's spending more time with um, kids in underrepresented groups to show them that to be part of tech, you don't have to necessarily be an engineer. Um, I've had conversations with junior high school kids and high school kids, and when I when I talk to them about tech, they automatically assume that they need to be good at math and science, which of course are important topics. So stay in school kids. <laughs> but then I tell them, you know, you could be a creative director at ESPN. You can be a art director for the NBA. And these are kids who literally in their minds, they thought that their only way out of you know, their neighborhoods was through sports. It blew their mind that there was another path to where they can still be part of sports and um, have a career. And I want to spread that message more. And now speaking of spreading that message, you're going to be speaking at Afrotech this year, right? That's right. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what you plan to get out of it? You know, the thing I love about Afrotech is just being in the presence of so many amazing brown people that also have a shared connection to tech. And so just that experience alone is one of the the, uh, the highs. Also, just as a plug, I'll be there recruiting for all types of roles uh, for Twitter, from you know technical roles to marketing roles to operations roles. So I'm, I'm going to be um, spending a lot of time with uh, prospective candidates and anyone who will talk to me about roles at Twitter. And as a plug, we uh, have an office in D.C. and Atlanta, New York, San Francisco. Uh, we want to hire people where they're at. So that will also be a big part of um, my time at Afrotech. Nice. How do you stay creative outside of work? I would imagine there's a lot of meetings that you have to go through. There's a lot of data you have to evaluate. At the end of the day, or really I'd say even maybe on the weekends or something, how do you keep that creative spark going? I play a lot. And some of that play extends to when I was a kid or stems from when I was a kid. As an example, um, I'm still big into radio control vehicles. I fly model jets. They're 12, 13 feet long. They run on uh, jet fuel. I build them, paint them, fly them. Uh, my son does this with me now, although he's, he's six, so he's not, um, he's not he doesn't fly the big ones. He flies the small ones. Mm -hmm. I also do some photography work and aerial videography work with a cinematographer. Um, that enables me to get, you know, get back into editing and storytelling. Um, so I just make play part of 
you know, my life. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, I keep a, a moleskin notepad next to my workbench and problems that I was stuck on at work get solved when I'm, uh, you know, working on uh, a, a side project or, or a hobby related project. Uh, so I just incorporate that. And then in a lot of cases, you know, some of the things I do as a hobby, um, whether it be, you know, racing cars or riding dirt bikes means I'm outside. Um, I'm in nature and that inspires me as well. Um, also it gives me a sense of uh, Zen and enables you know, me to decompress, which is also important, especially, you know, as a, a black male, you know, we all know about the stresses and, and, and the the physical condition of what stresses can do to us. Yeah, uh, it's important for me to have that release. Are you finding that your kids are getting interested in design now at their ages? Um, my kids are are you know really young. My daughter's two, so design for her is coloring Disney princesses. <laughs> um, my son's six, and he. He doesn't really understand design, uh, but he does understand me making things just because he sees me make things. So uh, he, you know, is an avid um, Roblox and Minecraft player. Um, we, you know, paint radio control car bodies together. Um, you know, he he tries to take something that a toy that you know is is off the shelf, and he'll he'll start to modify it. Um, whether painting on it or or uh, you know making it better for him, uh, so I, I, I'm starting to see some of that happen with him, which is really cool. Nice. What are you the most excited about at the moment? I'm really excited about Twitter. You know, a year from now, where um, we have a product that has uh, less toxicity on it, that's healthy. People can have the ability to share their point of view in a constructive way um, and feel safe on the platform. Um, I'm really excited about the prospect of enabling communities to um, uh, uh, thrive on that platform and to be able to connect with one another and work together to solve big problems that we're having in society and the world without trolls taking those conversations sideways. And I think that um, by designers um, having this conversation with other designers, with other companies, so we can make a better internet. And I think it's only going to happen by us being openly uh, transparent about our process and how we get there and working together. And uh, my hope is that more designers are having this discussion in addition to having discussions about pixels. The, the policies associated with our products are uh, more important right now than the pixels. Right now in your career, when you sort of look back at all the work that you've done, what do you wish you really would have known when you first started? Um, I wish I would have known that it was just going to be all right. Mm. You know, I, I stressed so much early in my career about being perfect um, by being the hardest worker, by uh, working the most hours, sleeping under my desk, um, and you know, having some balance would have been great. And if I known back then that things would have worked out, um, you know, maybe I could have uh, had a little bit of little less stress as I was, you know, on that journey. What does success look like for you now? For me now, success means my team being successful. That the designers on my team are doing their best work, that they're seen as the, uh, the, the best design team in, in the industry, that they're making profound change uh, towards positive social conversations on Twitter as a platform, uh, and they're doing the, the best work in their careers. And the, the next year, I'm, I'm hyper-focused on that. And speaking of the, the next year, even kind of moving forward from that, where do you see yourself in the next like five years or so? What kind of work would you like to be doing? You know, I have this uh, aspiration to work in TV again. You know, I kind of worked in TV when I was at Netflix, and I I do enjoy the the um, process of storytelling. And you know, there's a lot of interesting things that that I've seen in the Valley 
over the last 20 years, uh, stories that, that I think could make some interesting um, uh, content for, for TV. So, you know, if I squint, I think somewhere, you know, in the future, I'll be doing that. Okay. Writing for TV, maybe? Something like that? Po- yeah, possibly, yeah. No, not a bad idea there. Well, Dantley, just to kind of, you know, wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? You can find me on Twitter. I'm at Dantley, D-A-N-T-L-E-Y. All right. Sounds good. Well, Dantley Davis, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, Thank you for entertaining all the questions I had about Twitter. I, I knew that when I would have you on the show, people would want to know all sorts of stuff about Twitter. So I, I thank you for being able to answer the questions that you were able to answer, but also just to talk about what your experiences were like, you know, being a black man in Silicon Valley for this long, as well as being, you know, kind of a, a design leader, because there's not a lot of us at that level. Uh, so being able to talk about the work that you're doing and the impact that you want to have, I think is not only just super important, but it's also great in terms of visibility. So others can see that this is, a model that they can aspire to as well. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Maurice. It was a pleasure. Um, hope I can do it again. Thoughts of love are in your mind. And that's it for this week. Big thanks to Dantley Davis and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Dantley and his work through the links in the show notes at glitch.com forward slash revision path. Revision Path is a Glitch Media Network podcast and is produced by Maurice Cherry and edited by Brittany Brown. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. We're also powered by Simplecast, the easiest way for podcasters to publish and distribute audio on the internet. Make sure you check the show notes for a link to sign up for a 14-day free trial. And if you like this episode, then please let more people know about it by leaving us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. It takes about a minute or so to do. It's really, really simple, but it also helps spread the word about Revision Path everywhere, worldwide. You can also find us on Spotify. We're on Google Podcasts. We're on SoundCloud. Basically, wherever you find your favorite shows. And make sure you're following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as well. Just search for Revision Path. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.